Hi folks, welcome to lecture two. Last lecture we looked at classical realism. This lecture we'll look at uh, neorealism or new realism or, or probably the better um, uh, term for it is structural realism. And I'll explain why uh, in this lecture. So last lecture we looked at classical realism, realism's explanation uh, of war being the result of human nature, right? Uh, so Hans Morgenthau uh, had a very dark interpretation of human nature. Uh, he, uh, amongst his uh, many uh, famous quotes, uh, he, he is three, the drives to live, to propagate and to dominate are common to all men. Power politics rooted in a lust for power, which is common to all men, is for this reason inseparable from social life itself. And man's aspiration for power is not an accident of history. It is not a temporary devi deviation from a natural state of freedom. Rather, it's an all permeating fact, which is, a, which is the very essence of human existence. So super dark. Um, today's lecture on uh, new realism or structural realism isn't that much um, uh, lighter or more more um, uh, positive, uh, uh, but the explanations of why war happens isn't rooted in human nature as such. Uh, the new explanation of um, uh, Kenneth Waltz, he looked at the structure of the international system. Uh, and he, so he's saying that the structure of the, of the international system is an anarchy. An anarchy in that there is no higher power to enforce the peace. So within states, we don't have an anarchy because we have a sovereign power, uh, you know, a king or a government or a you know democracy or however you want to do it. But the the main function of a state is to control violence uh, within it, and it's really really a revenge machine in 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 that if someone uh, kills me or steals from me or something like that, uh, then I know the state, the state's role is to uh, investigate and hunt them down and, and to punish them. And so that, that acts as, uh, not this revenge machine acts as a deterrent um, to law breaking. So that's how we, um, that's how we handle the problem of violence uh, within states. But between states, there is no higher power that can come and, and punish, uh, you know, states, right? It's a self-help system. There, it's an anarchy, right? Uh, there's no world government. There's no uh, global empire um, that can suppress violence um, between states. So this is the structure of the international system. It's an anarchy. It's an uh, anarchical system. And Waltz says that this is the key factor of uh, uh, that explains why wars happen. And linked to this is the, the concept of a security dilemma, security paradox, and, and it can turn into a security dilemma spiral. So the security dilemma is that we can't be sure of others' intentions. So it's really... Um, the structure of things really actually goes back to uh, humans uh, cannot read each other's minds, right? And uh, uh, so in terms of international relations, the security dilemma is we cannot be certain of the intentions of other states when they say that they are friendly uh, because a they could be deceiving us and someone who is a state who is deceiving us would say that they are friends right they're friendly um 
So the dilemma here is that we can't know for certain who our friends and who our enemies are going to be who our enemies are, or if the intentions of uh, one or the other will change without us realizing. So in an anarchy, there is a security dilemma. We can't be certain because we can't read minds. And this leads to a security paradox in that because a security dilemma means we have to uh, prepare for war, um, and we have to treat even our friends with some suspicion, that can, that if we choose wrong, so if we treat a potential friend as an enemy, it tends to turn them into an enemy and reduce our security. Yeah. Or if we, if we again choose wrong and, and treat an enemy as a friend, that also uh, invites disaster and, and um, and reduces our security. So there's a paradox there that, that comes out of the dilemma. And the tragedy of this is that what often happens is, is you have these security dilemma spirals where uh, one country is just, um, you know, builds some, uh, um, some tanks or some military uh, um, power and then all the neighbours go, oh, why are they doing that? Um, we better just build up our defences a little bit uh, so that uh, they can't surprise us, right? Even though everyone is saying they're all friendly, um, you get this arms race that just sort of starts slowly and builds up momentum as, as both sides look at the others and go, listen, oh, why are they building more tanks and planes and, and a bigger navy if if they're not lying about being our friend? And they so and they think the same of of uh, the other side. So you have this security dilemma spiral that can lead into war. There's also the concept of uh, a balance of power, right? And the at least for Waltz, there is a tendency towards a balance of power in that you, if you have a, a country that is rising in power, rising in military might, the, the, the potential threat that they pose to all its neighbours will mean that, you, that there will be a tendency for the weaker um, neighbours to team up in an alliance to balance the power of the of the major regional power right so you, you tend to have regionally and globally these these balances of, uh, um, or balancing coalitions to balance the rising power of, of one state or another so Waltz puts this all together as a as a new theory, a new explanation for for state behaviour and for for war uh, that he calls structural realism, because it's rooted in the structure of reality, really, or the, this both the structure of the the international system being an anarchy, and the structure of our human um, inability to to read each other's minds, right? So he's got um, three, three parts of his theory. Number one, the defining characteristic of the state system is that it is an anarchy. So there's no higher authority and this leads to, to uh, the security dilemma. Uh, number two, there's no functional differentiation between units. All states have the same goal of survival, no matter if they're Muslim or Christian or a democracy or a, you know dictatorship or or capitalist or communist or whatever, structural realism says none of that matters. The, there's no functional differentiation between states. They all have the same goal, and that is survival, and all must face the security dilemma. And number three. What what explains outcomes, right, uh, uh, is 
changing distributions of capabilities. Right? So rooted really in, in economics, uh, uh, which then translates into military power and the balance of power. Right? If, if the balance of power is upset, then it can, uh, can lead to war. So following on from um, Waltz's original uh, structural realism, it's actually been uh, broken into two now. We have defensive realists uh, um, that Kenneth Waltz is the, the main protagonist, and we also have offensive realism, um, which uh, is probably spearheaded by um, John Mearsheimer. So both are structural realists in that uh, they are looking at the anarchical system and the inability to know, uh, to read each other's minds. Uh, so both are, are basing their theories in that, in structure of the, of the system and, and our minds, but they come to two different um, uh, conclusions. So I'll, I'll have a look at both. So firstly, defensive realism. For defensive realists, conquest is extremely risky. It, it carries a high risk of self-encirclement, right? So if you start acting aggressively, it will generate a balancing coalition uh, to contain you, right? Uh, and, that, that's, um, and that's held out, that's proven by the historical record, right? Um, because there's this tendency towards um, balancing of power, because every all the weaker states are trying to ensure their survival, right? So this means that conquest is extremely risky um, and is rarely profitable, especially especially in a situation where you don't have empires, you have reasonable free trade. So you don't need to um, you don't need to go to war to get oil or wheat or whatever, right? You can just buy it on the open market, right? Um, and conquest or attempts of conquest often result in overextension and drains resources and eventually leaves uh, leaves you vulnerable. Right? Uh, so Germany, uh, Nazi Germany is the, the perfect um, uh, example of this. Right? Um, it, the uh, the war drained their resources. It didn't. Um, it didn't add to their over, you know, to the equation, and uh, eventually broke them. Major powers are more concerned about maintaining their current status than overthrowing the system and attempting to become the hegemon or the the, um, the leading power, the the the, um, the dominating power. Uh, so defensive realists. Th argue that major powers are more concerned with just maintaining their current status. Right? They're, not, um, they're not shooting for the moon to try and rule the world. Uh, they're just trying to survive. And for defensive realists, the anarchical system they, that states find themselves in encourages them to be cautious and reserved in their attempts to maintain their survival and security. And for defensive realists, the international system provides very few incentives for expansion now. It's usually very difficult, it's really profitable, and it can lead to your complete destruction by generating a, a balancing coalition against you. Waltz also notes that if balancing is the norm and if states understand this tendency, aggression is discouraged because those who contemplate it will anticipate resistance. Similarly, uh, another author, Lane, um, uh, from the defensive realist side, states that one of history's few incontestable lessons is that the pursuit of hegemony, hegemony invariably is self-defeating. Right? Uh, balance of power theory, where, where the idea is that states will always try and balance against um, uh, rising powers, or against the hegemon, suggests that expanding hegemons will be opposed and stopped, and these lessons have been repeatedly demonstrated um, 
And even if there have been some states that have failed to learn this lesson, so maybe Germany, uh, enough learning takes place to make violent, excessive, expansionist policies the exception rather than the rule. So, uh, so Napoleon um, being defeated by uh, you know expanding through Europe and and being defeated by Russia and uh, and and uh, European uh, the UK or Germany trying the same um, defeating defeated by the same you know this this balancing coalition is generated if uh, if a state becomes too expansionary so if great powers are so defensive and cautious and reluctant to try and expand or um, attack others how how does defensive realism explain all the wars right. well they, they have several um, explanations. The first one is that they, they argue that the security dilemma can easily spiral out of control, even if both states don't want a war, even if both states are what we call status quo powers in that they want to maintain the status quo, not, uh, not, not upend the, the international system, or, and they're not trying to become the hegemon. But these arms races can can these spiral out of control um, and into war and especially because um, yeah okay the second one is geography can make the security dilemma better or worse okay so um, uh, Germany or or even France's position in the middle of um, of Europe makes the security dilemma worse. Uh, Europe is a flat open plain um, that uh, you know you can march across right um, where you know very different to uh, the UK's island or the US's island um, uh, or Australia's right uh, much easier for Indonesia and Australia to to manage this the any underlying security dilemma because it's so so difficult to uh, cross water and and um, start a war the third the third explanation is that the you you can have pathological elite beliefs or, or uh, wrong beliefs in in the leadership of countries so you could think uh, you know uh, uh, toxic nationalism uh, so think of the Nazis who who really believed that they had some sort of uh, um, uh, they were superior a superior race and deserved to to rule the world or something like that some other nonsense uh, or uh, in the lead up to World War One there was a there was a misunderstanding about the offensive defensive balance of weapons technology and had, and how it had changed dramatically. Um, we, as I spoke about it um, last lecture, that uh, previously the the uh, the concept of war was that it was short and relatively, um, you know, the costs of it were contained, and it was uh, uh, you know better to just have a short, sharp war and get it over with, and that'll that'll settle the matter. Uh, what they didn't understand was the synergy of technologies, what that synergy would mean between trench warfare, uh, uh, barbed wire, Gatling guns, um, uh, artillery, uh, and all being, uh, all being resupplied constantly with, with uh, fast railway, right? They didn't understand that the age old tactic of, of running at lines to break them was was had now become suicide uh, and so that that misunderstanding on on all sides of the war leading up to it um, uh, uh, m made them all jump into a war that they thought would be over by Christmas but it ended up a meat grinder for you know for four years so these um, 
the security dilemma can get out of control or you can have weird uh, uh, state beliefs about you know their superiority or or whatever so what does the other side of structural realism say uh, so this is offensive realism so this is uh, John Mearsheimer's um, the tragedy of tragedy of great power politics and offensive realists that they argued that security is scarce. Major powers can't know how much power they will need in the future in to ensure their survival. So, so because of this uncertainty and because it's a self-help system, it's an anarchy, major powers always try to maximize their power, influence, wealth, military power at every stage, at every opportunity in order to ensure their survival because they they, if they don't take those opportunities, uh, then then it could lead to others uh, being able to dominate them, um, maybe even uh, end their existence. Right? And so that also means that they um, uh, they they will attack um, others in order to reduce the power of others, right? Uh, and so, so offensive realism has this much more um, combative uh, edge to it, or conclusion to it. The best way for a state to increase its odds of survival is to become the most powerful state, so the hegemon, uh, at least regionally. And if a state does not try to maximise its influence and decides to forego an opportunity to expand or increase its power, then other major powers will take advantage of the opportunity and as a consequence status quo powers are assumed to be very rare for offensive realists conquest pays huge dividends if you win um, and aggressors win 60 percent of the time um, uh, winning is is very profitable right <laughs> uh, plus weapons tech usually favours striking first and preventative war is very effective. So you have a combination of that. Uh, it, it leads to the conclusion that war will be much more um, uh, common than the defensive realists uh, conclusion. And though, though Mishama does spend a lot of time arguing that the, the stopping power of water means uh, no global hegemon is actually possible and certainly no global uh, empire or something like that um, uh, yeah. for offensive realists there are four conditions that will promote expansion by by major powers so this is uh, if weapons technology favors striking first and and striking first, it almost always does, all the way up until nuclear weapons, right? So, so the nuclear weapons is seen as a bit of a stabilising factor. But when when nuclear weapon uh, when weapons technology favours striking first, that will promote expansion by major powers. Number two, when resources can be easily extracted from the vanquished, right? So. Modernization makes societies far more profitable and makes repression easier due to the centralization of control and dependence and um, uh, and you know uh, you can control a lot of farmers with pitchforks if you've got a, a you know uh, an army with machine guns right um, and even the internet and everything it makes makes control actually much easier so. Social resistance would have to be extreme to make conquest of a modern society unprofitable. That's the offensive realist's argument. Number three, when a major power's relative power is in decline, making preventative war much more likely. Because preventative war is usually very effective. Number four, when the distribution of power is multipolar, which allows opponents to be defeated piecemeal, right? So one at a time, and and it greatly increases the chances of miscalculations about relative power. Whereas if you have a situation like the Cold War, where you have a very uh, bipolar system, the the chances of miscalculation are reduced because the 
you know the the two powers are very uh, balanced right whereas in a whereas in a multipolar system uh, no one has got dominant power and so the chances for of miscalculations uh, leading to war uh, uh, increase so um, to just to finish up the the idea so for offensive and defensive realists the choice of buck passing so this is when um, instead refusing to confront a growing threat in hope that another state will right passing the buck for uh, to them or balancing uh, against the hegemon or bandwagging with uh, a hegemon or a potential aggressor the the choice between them is a function of the structure of the international system so that both offensive and defensive um, realist view bipolar uh, uh, a threatened great power in a bipolar system must balance against a rival because there's no other great power to catch the buck right to um, whereas in a multipolar system states often buck pass more uh, and states prefer to buck pass rather than balance when confronted by a dangerous opponent buck passing is most widespread when there is no potential hegemon to contend with and the threatened states do not share a common border and the more relative power the potential hegemon controls the more likely it is that that all of the threatened states in the system will forego buck passing and form a, a counterbalancing coalition so common borders promote balancing while while barriers and buffers encourage uh, buck passing uh, and that that makes sense in that the risk the higher the risk um, you know in that you're they are neighbors and um, uh, and there's no uh, no natural barriers between you then the risks are much higher and you will be more alert uh, and willing to um, to nip any sort of uh, um, growing power in the, in the bud so great powers rarely bandwagon only weak states with no great power patron adopt such a risky strategy since there's no guarantee that the that your um, that the aggressor state will be satisfied with you coming on as an ally rather than uh, um, being completely dominated um, uh, so it is, it is a risky strategy and um, great powers don't normally bandwagon Okay, so that's uh, structural realism or neo-realism, uh, and uh, we've so given you both the uh, defensive uh, and the offensive. Uh, the offensive conclusions are, are pretty dark and scary. Uh, the defensive ones are are, are, um, uh, are much uh, lighter and nicer, and uh, and especially the defensive realists tend to think that nuclear weapons are, are a very stabilizing force which is probably true uh, so uh, I hope you found that interesting um, all many of the other um, uh, theories that we'll look at in the in the coming lectures are really a reaction against uh, realism classical and and structural uh, try, trying to find a way of solving the problem uh, of war um, rather than uh, the realist solution really being you better prepare for it <laughs> okay uh, i'll see you in the next lecture